hand over to Martin. All right, hello. Yeah, so I'm Martin from Relic Plastic. Uh, so we're located uh, just on the coast of Hesham near Lancaster in the UK. And we're kind of a, a small scale kind of recycling facility, uh, but we focus a lot on kind of workshops like we're doing today and talking to people more about kind of the process of recycling uh, and more about circular economy of, you know, not just recycling is important. We need to think about how we can reuse material and also kind of reduce our consumption of materials that we use as well. So I'm going to talk today about kind of an intro of who we are, what we do, kind of where we came out of. Uh, we're going to go look at plastic a bit more up closely and kind of explore, you know, why, why do we use plastic? Why is it good? Um, I know a lot of people recently, you know, we're seeing how bad it is kind of getting into our environment and affecting wildlife and whatnot. Um, and we're going to then have a practical demonstration of us recycling plastic. So we're going to shred plastic and melt it and reform it into something new uh, right in front of your screens. Um, and then a little bit of an outro after that. So um, we came out something called Precious Plastic, which is this kind of global organization um, of, of people. Uh, and they kind of they downscaled the production methods that are used industrially kind of around the world. Uh, but they made them really small uh, and so they were much more easily adopted uh, by everyone and the idea was to boost recycling um, and we, we saw this as a great opportunity to kind of show you as we will do later kind of how recycling works you know at the moment we're in this kind of period where or we're at this loss where you put your material in your curbside recycling bin hopefully hope you all do uh, and then it kind of it gets taken away and it, it disappears and we, we we lose where that goes and it's really hard to track because it, it goes all around the world and process in many different ways um, so I've got a short video to kind of explain what precious plastic is uh, it was formed by this guy called Dave um, out of the Netherlands so hopefully you can see and hear this video we are precious plastic and we don't like waste so we made an entire plastic recycling workspace inside an old shipping container. It contains all the tools and machines to turn plastic waste into valuable things. Plastic is collected, shredded and turned into something new, all inside the space. This workspace can turn plastic trash into, let's say, beautiful balls in any color, or strong wall grips. And with precise molds, it can make precise objects, or simply make any wall more beautiful. Make beams and construct a big tower, or start small with a jewelry collection. This workspace can be set up all over the world, from cities to tropical beaches to the middle of a landfill. Plastic trash goes in, valuable items out. Hopefully that gives quite a nice little overview of what the idea was that you've got these small scale machines um, and imagine you know these are the same sort of machines that are used on a huge industrial level um, but these being small make them really accessible so you've got from left to right an injection molder uh, which is what we'll use later today and what we specialize in here at Relic um, which is essentially is the heated pipe we put plastic in at the top it melts we push it out at the bottom into a mold um, of a different shape that we want to form uh, next, along to the right, is an extruder, which is kind of like an injection molder, but on its side. So you've still got a heated pipe, because uh, what we're doing is just heating the plastic till it melts and then reforming it to something else. So the extruder is really good for long pieces. So you saw that little tower that made them, um, or made out of beams. Um, next, we've got the shredder. And so that just shreds up the material, the plastic, into smaller pieces so we can use it in these different forms. And then they have this kind of compression oven, which is which is used to make those bowls that he had in his hand. And precious plastic is kind of developed as a, a global community. So it's all open source. There are different people who have adopted this. Uh, and they've upgraded these. And the big one is that machine on the right that creates these big sheets. So big panels of plastic. And you'll notice, um, hopefully throughout that video, all the colors are really exciting. Um, so what we love about precious plastic and having this small scale um, kind of um, the, school, the small scale machines is that, and operations, is that we separate out all the colors 
and then we can bespokely mix them. Um, we'll see a little bit more of that later as well. And it creates these beautiful products. And that's what we want plastic to be. We want plastic to be beautiful and functional. And we want those products that we make to last a really long time. Like we don't want to make products that last a really short time and that we don't like or value because that's what leads to them getting wasted, thrown away, ending up piling on beaches or going just into the ground in landfill where it's useless um, or being incinerated. So yeah, we're there behind all the bundle. This is kind of a map of global community um, doing things. And loads of people do different things. Some people do machine building. Some people do uh, recycling the plastic into different products. Some do workshops like we're doing today. So examples of what we've made. Um, so we, we have made some small sheets. Um, we make pots. Um, and like the one thing about the sheets is that, you know, we can from sheet material, you can then make different things. So you've got like a lampshade and we make made a carrier bag dispenser. And there's, you know, there's loads of things that we can make. So there's a, one of the big sheets that um, kind of central team made, you know, stools. Um, we collaborate with a company and we make hair combs, so, uh, or Afro picks. And again, you start to see all these beautiful patterns that we can achieve because we keep them all separate and we bespokely mix them, which is completely different to the kind of like the, the big industry that mixes things into kind of a solid color. Another product, uh, these knife handles. So these are made for kind of chef's knives. So we make the handles. Uh, someone else we work with, they put a blade on them uh, and you have this beautiful functional knife. Uh, another one that we recently started working on is this part of the coffee filter. And another great example from the UK, um, Dolls. So this is a group up in Glasgow. They get bottle tops, melt them all into a nice disc and then put some locally sourced wooden legs on it and create a really nice stool. Another one, this is speakers made out of carrier bags. And what I want to get across with all these products is that these are products that, you know, are functional and beautiful. So we can use these again and again. Um, you know, visually, they're really lovely and lots of people get really excited by the colours. And what we like that to do is up the value of the plastic. You know, we want people to value plastic, but it means that they, they keep hold of it. You know, we want to use that stool for, you know, tens, hundreds of years. We want that stool to be passed down to, you know, when you're, you know, clearing out someone's house, you go, wow, this is an amazing stool. I'm going to keep that because it's beautiful and functional and I value that. At the moment, we have the problem where we create a lot of products that we don't value and they just become waste that, you know, they're designed to just be thrown in the bin, which is not how we should treat plastic because as we are now seeing, it lasts for a very long time and that's having particularly destructive effects um, in our world. So I wanna get a little bit more kind of hands-on with plastic. So um, I imagine if actually we've got teachers um, with classrooms on this call. Um, so uh, if I could ask teachers to manage, and if you're not a teacher of the class, then you know, and you're an individual, then you can go around yourself. If they could ask maybe a few students um, to kind of go on a bit of a plastic hunt around the classroom or wherever you are, and pick up maybe five or six items that are made out of plastic, um, and it'd be really good if I could, if we could um, get on video and have teachers kind of hold up a few of the plastic items we found, um, and we'll have a discussion. So if I can ask people to kind of go away go on a little plastic hunt, bring back five items, and then uh, whoever's behind the camera can maybe interact with those. How long do you want to give people, Martin? Uh, I was going to just wait a minute. Um, so I'm kind of counting down a minute. Um, and then I, if, if people are ready and have something, then if they can flick their video on so I can see that they, they've got something, then that would be, that'd be handy.
Right, as people have people got anything, click on their video if they have. And if not, I've got some other examples that we can go through. Well, I've got some things if you want to let me kick off. Go on then, what have, what have you got? I've got the top off a five litre plastic container. Okay. Anything else? I have got a container which I have reused for putting things in and the triangle mark on it. Yep. Doesn't have a number in it. Oh, I hate those. And I have a very old hanger plastic. Ah, yes. Excellent. Great. Well, these are on our list that we're going to talk about. Um, is that tub, uh, what did it, do you remember what it contained originally? Um, it's probably mushrooms. Yeah, mushroom tub. Okay. So we're kind of going to go and explore. Uh, so Dan mentioned this kind of recycling triangle um, that you found on the tub. And these are what's called resin identification codes. So I don't expect people to be memorizing what they see. Um, these are kind of like the long names plastics given. Um, but what I want to kind of get out is like, there are, there are six kind of categories that we find uh, quite commonly kind of domestically around our home. Um, and then there's kind of this categorization of seven, which is other, uh, which categorizes, you know, hundreds and maybe thousands of different plastics. Cause you know, one of the big messages here is that plastic isn't just plastic. There are loads of different types and we use them for different reasons. So, you know, why, why is Jan's bottle cap made out of a different plastic to the one that the coat hanger is used for, for example. So we're going to go through exploring them. And if you do have something in front of you, it's quite nice. You get a bit more tactile and you can see it. You might see differences between the plastics. We're going to kick off with seven or other. And typically, um, kind of around the house, you might find sweet wrappers or crisp packets. Like these are kind of something that um, different plastics. Um, other examples are... Uh, I guess 3D printer filament is one. Um, they're normally kind of classes other because they might be nylon or PLA or ABS. Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of a, a, a pretty crazy category because there are, you know, it incorporates hundreds, thousands um, of different plastics. We're going a bit more specific and maybe something that we will find more. So polystyrene um, on number six. Uh, you probably, we all know polystyrene is kind of the foamy thing that we might use as packaging insulation, uh, packaging um, foam, but there are other things like coffee cup lids, uh, particularly uh, Muller corner pots, um, Jan's coat hanger, that'll be made of polystyrene. And so something really interesting about polystyrene, um, like some of the properties, one really interesting one is that you can polish it really well. And so uh, you'll notice kind of those coat hangers with a metal hook are normally really shiny. Um, and there are people in the kind of the precious plastic community that have made beams out of polystyrene or they make sheets out of them. And the polishing you get and the finishing is really amazing. Um, it's also quite brittle. So you might find if you have a coffee cup lid or like a Muller corner pot, or you, we probably all know the plastic cutlery breaks really easily. Like the plastic cutlery is, you know, one of those things that it's a bit of a stupid design because it breaks so easily, you can't reuse it. It's kind of made to be used once and that's it, which is one of the problems with um, some of the plastic that we have today. I'm just going to interrupt you a minute, so, uh, Martin. Somebody's um, put in the chat, they can't put their camera on, um, but they've got an old hand gel bottle. The Ooh. lid's broken so they can't reuse it. Mm -hmm. A plastic bag from the inside of a cereal packet. Okay. And a plastic takeaway lunch that had a lunch in it. Okay, good. Um, so that uh, kind of cereal packet is probably quite a crispy, um, filmy plastic, um, which is different to something later when we look at LDP, which is quite stretchy plastic, which carrier bags are made from. Um, and I thought um, this is one of the, also the difficult things that I want to get the message across to is that we have plastics that seem very similar, but they're actually very different. Um, and so, you know, you've got what seems like a film, so that cereal packet, um, versus a carrier bag. They're both kind of filmy. One is quite crinkly, one is kind of soft and flexible, and they're different plastics. But, you know, on the face of it, they're similar as well. And so other examples, so the next plastic I was going to talk about is polypropylene. Um, if you have a coat hanger that is kind of 100% plastic, um, as opposed to, so Jan held up one that has a metal hook on it, and the rest is plastic, they're different plastics. And so what we're kind of trying to explore here is this idea 
when we get told that something is recyclable, well, is it always that product or no? Because that, you know, when I say a coat hanger, that coat hanger might be a different plastic. And polypropylene is easier to recycle than polystyrene. Um, so for us at Relic, it gets quite difficult with our messaging about what we accept um, and what we can't accept because we can't deal with some plastics, but we can deal with others. So it gets really complicated. You know, essentially, plastic is complicated um, and it makes it really tricky for systems to kind of be created uh, to recycle them. So, you know, we put our items in the curbside bin. I don't know where people are from on the call, but, you know, we might be different in different councils. So here in Lancaster, only a year or two years ago that originally we could only recycle bottles. And that's because it was uh, two plastics, which we'll explore later. Uh, like a bottle is pretty guaranteed to be PET or HDP. Um, and only recently we've had pots, tubs and trays, which kind of incorporates more polypropylene um, into them. And some councils will only recycle certain things. And we don't really use these resin identification codes at all because um, that would be a different way of categorizing things. So hopefully through all my warbling, you're getting the idea that plastic is quite complicated. <laughs> um, we talked a bit about LDPE. Um, one really cool thing about LDPE, because um, I just want to discuss like, you know, why we use different plastics for different things, um, is that flexibility. So this is a, a little LDP sheet we've made. And like, we love just how flexible it is. Um, so it's really strong, but really flexible. And that's how we made a couple of those products um, that you saw on a slide earlier, like the lampshade. We could we could curve this round um, and create the kind of shape um, and lend it. And same for the use of things like carrier bags. Like it's really flexible for what we need it to be. Uh, next one is PVC. So we see this a lot. You know, all your a lot of electrical wires that you'll see around um, or piping. Uh, so a really strong point of PVC is that it's very chemically resistant. So if you think about you know what we put on our pipes or you know exposure to elements that windows have which are another example of pvc and you know we don't want metal inside wires to corrode and break because we don't want any electrical faults because that'd be very dangerous you know we want this to be really strong kind of strong against chemical resistance um so that's why we might use pvc for something rather than a different plastic and getting on to the two plastics that normally we see bottles made out of so hdp your milk bottle they are normally made of HDPE and same for a lot of bottle caps. Um, they, they use HDPE and this is a really valued material. So this one is re really widely recycled and as is PET, which is your classic Coke bottle material. Um, or sometimes you get some food, um, some food trays out of it. So that's why I was interested from Jan. She held up her tub and she said it had mushrooms in it. So they're more likely to be a polypropylene tray Whereas these ones, for example, the raspberries in are a PET tray. So again, different material, uh, different recyclability, different values. Um, so kind of the big companies love this um, PET and HDP because um, they're really easily recycled. Whereas other materials, so PVC isn't, we don't accept any PVC. Um, we work with propylene, LDPE, and HDP because they're easy and safe to recycle. Yeah, so from all of that, as I imagine it would be a bit bewildering, I want you to know that you know we have we use certain plastics and there are lots of plastics because they have different uses, um, whether that's you know the flexibility, the ability to be clear so we can see products through them, chemical resistance, all of these things. Um, and it's also really confusing because we make very similar products out of different plastics, and that makes it hard for us to kind of <clears throat> have the end of life with them whether that's recycling or reusing them. So something a bit more fun to watch. Um, we're going to recycle some plastic. So we're going to go through the process that we, we do here at Relic, where we, we gather material in, uh, we color sort it all, we sort it by type, because um, we don't want to mix types either. And sometimes they don't, they don't bond, and that means your product's going to be useless. Um, and then we shred them. And then we melt them predominantly using injection molders, that machine with a heated pipe, which we will see. So for the next um, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, um, the camera angles might become a bit weird. Um, so we'll try and go as we can, because I've got to have someone else holding a laptop up um, whilst I do the practical work. 
So we'll see how it goes. Um, and we're going to have a bit of space for questions as well. So if you've got any questions so far, um, or questions generally about plastic, about recycling, um, about you know the world, uh, just put them in the chat, and I'm going to get Jan to ask me those questions, um, just so I don't get overwhelmed trying to read everything at once. Uh, and I'll say when we when we can go through questions. So. Right, there is. All right, can I have my camera assistant? So if you want to give a bit of a, a lean over here. Right, so this is our trim machine. Essentially, we've got and so. Mm -hmm. yep. so we've got So if you have a look at what that sort of material turns into, um, I hope you can see that in my hands. So that's just, you know, the same material, uh, just made smaller, and that means we can put it in our machines, um, which you'll see later. So if we come over to our injection mold there. So we've got some of our green. Uh, I'm going to put this, I'm going to mix this into the part of some other sheds that we've got. And I'm going to mix these up. You'll notice in the background some of our combs that we make. So we enjoy this as a nice little color display. Okay, so this wheel I'm moving now is basically a plunger. If you just lower the screen a little bit and tilt it away. Yeah. So, as I just promised, so this is a heated pipe. So, that's what gets hot. We're going to put the plastic in at the top. And then we're going to wait for it to melt. Uh, and that's when, yeah, so I'm going to put this in. So, I'm just kind of moving a plunger up that runs through the machine. With this wheel. So you can see just the plastic in the hopper at the moment, and I'm just poking it into the machine. Okay, so that's our machine filled up. We're going to push this down and then we're going to wait for it to melt. So that's going to take a little bit of time, uh, which is now a perfect time for any questions. So if there are questions in the chat, can I get Jan to read them out to me? Okay, I'll just wait for people to put um, type the questions in. I've got a few questions for you. Um, where do yep. you get the the plastic waste from that you that you were showing us there? 
Yeah, so these bottle cops have been collected from kind of a local um, kind of a local collection point. So we've got a few different kind of uh, bins around the town um, in collaboration with, collaboration with the Plastic Bottle Top Project. And they're collected kind of uh, every now and then. They're brought here and then we sort them all. And then we also have sorting parties where people can come in and help sort them. So a lot of people find it really fun sorting all the bottle caps. Uh, and it's really nice, uh, again, this idea of us being kind of a small scale uh, recycling is that we have this space where people can come in and see it all. So it's great to have people come in and see the process kind of a bit like we're doing today. Um, so that's the bottle tops, for example. Uh, we get other things kind of more locally such as DVD cases and uh, mushroom tubs we take uh, and like big sweet tubs. Um, so I can show you a little bit of a walkabout. Uh, so you can see this kind of purple stack of sweet tubs that we've collected. Um, we've got things like coat hangers um, that have come from students leaving the university. So when they leave, they leave behind some bits and pieces. So we're taking coat hangers. Um, so they're all quite kind of small, more domestic um, sort of plastics that we take. Uh, but there are other examples of more kind of industrial things. So we have a lot of these things which are cones that are used for dyeing yarn, for example. So if you imagine like lots of yarn is put around this cone and it's submerged into a dye. Um, and other things like uh, when a manufacturing company is producing something, they might have uh, like leftover material or offcuts um, or their, maybe their products have gone wrong and so they can't sell them. We've accepted those as well. So we kind of operate on almost two scales where there's lots of small little bits domestically and then sometimes like really big amounts from kind of industrial partners. Great, thank you. Um, there's a, a question, there's a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is, what is the effect of traces of different types of plastic in the finished product? product? Could this even be a feature in some designs? Tracing plastic into the products. Well, the effect um, of traces of different yeah, types is... of plastic. Oh, the effect of traces, sorry, okay. Um, uh, so sometimes it means that plastic might not um, kind of bond, uh, bond as well. So if you're mixing plastics, um, yeah, they don't essentially mix. And so that means your product might just fail. Um, so it, it might crack or it might split. Um, or sometimes we see it kind of almost has these like, uh, like layers in it. Um, but sometimes you, it, you know, a small amount might not actually affect the final product much. Um, but it might kind of it may might make it harder, you know. If, if you're going to recycle something again and again and again, it might make it more difficult. Um, if you're kind of mixing more like impurities um, differently, so the worst case is that your product just doesn't work. Um, the best case is it kind of if it's small enough, it doesn't really matter. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question in the chat: How do materials change when you've recycled them? Do you find that they're weaker or denser? Yeah, we get this question a lot and um, so something I didn't talk about, uh, a feature of polypropylene for example is it has this kind of hinge property, so if you think about maybe uh, like a flip up cap on a bottle like a Lucozade cap or maybe some shampoo caps, they have a, a hinge and that's plastic and that's quite a particular property of polypropylene, so another reason why we use maybe a specific plastic for a specific item. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's quite a special feature and I think if we're trying to do a lot of recycled plastic with special features like that, it might degrade over time and might not be able to achieve that. Um, but the products we make, they're all quite solid bits of plastic. So it doesn't really matter. They don't have to have those properties. And that a little bit goes hand in hand with kind of creating products that we want to last, that we want to be strong and functional and last a long time. Like we want to create those products. We don't want to create something that breaks. So the products we do make, don't really have particularly kind of I guess special features like the hinge or um, particularly thin bits they're all quite thick um, so we don't really see any degradation like we don't see any um, kind of less of a property of plastic they they do what they need to do the products that we make you know the comb stays intact when you comb your hair the knife handle stays as a nice um, handle to hold 
um, you know, our plant pots hold water and strong, you know, we could stand on the plant pots that we make because um, they're thick. So we haven't seen any problems, um, but that is a bit about the design of products that we're making as well. Um, who are the clients for your products? Uh, well, so um, this brand above me, uh, the Combs, uh, which is quite funny because at the moment I'm almost combing my hair, aren't I, if I move? Right. Um, uh, there's a brand called Recomb, um, someone else called Aurea is with the coffee filters. So uh, we get numerous people that just contact us um, and say, you know, they have a product idea, they want to make it come to life. And so we can work with them from a, a design stage, you know, let's say they have just an idea in their head, we can help kind of draw that and we can model it um, using computers. Um, and then we can eventually kind of design a mold. So you saw in the very beginning of the video, um, those kind of metal molds and then the iPhone cases that came out because um, essentially a mold is just an inverse of the product you want to make. Um, and you'll see a mold up close when we inject the product. Um, so yeah, we just get contacted by a number of people. Um, we make a few of our own products. Some people see those and then want to buy um, or make something similar to those. Um, yeah, lots of different avenues. What are the products that you made that you, you've just done yourself rather than for a client? Uh, so our best products or most popular products that we make ourselves are small kind of cover pots, plant pots. Um, um, I think just because they're obviously kind of easily functional, like a lot of people get to see exactly how they're used. Um, and then they also, they have a lot of surface area. So they're very beautiful um, to look at. So. There's some examples. So this one is made from fishing root plastic. Let me push the middle button. Um, and then we have things like made out of uh, milk bottle caps. So um, your blue caps um, and white caps from different bottle tops. Um, so yeah, so these have proved our, our most popular products. Uh, we make other things such as soap dishes, um, posters. We've made candle holders. Um, and yeah, we kind of always have different ideas that we could make. Okay. Um, where did you get your initial funding from? Initial funding, so, um, so when I first founded, um, founded this, I was at, at the university and we kind of, the project kind of came a bit out there. So we managed to get some funding for, um, from the university to buy some initial machines. Um, Otherwise, it's been like a lot of voluntary work, um, a lot of kind of getting off the ground and trying to create like a, a financial system that works for us. Um, and we've had another another funder, um, some kind of a trust fund that's funded us as well. Um, yeah. right, so it's not all just being from the sale of the products that you do. Not all of it, no. Um, um, but it's helped a lot. Like we have, yeah, there was a lot of kind of our own time going into it until we got to a point where we were a bit more self-sustaining, um, which we've got to hopefully now. Um, there's another question in the chat asking, what computer modeling do you do? Ooh, so something called CAD, which is computer aided design. Um, so uh, basically you can you know, draw out your products, make them. Um, uh, and so you can just see a whole 3D, 3D model of like the product you want and then we use that the same for making molds as well that we model what mold we want uh, to create the inverse of that um, and then you know we might also prototype using 3d printing um, so generally people come to us and say they have a product um, and they're very excited uh, but for us with injection molding you have to have a mold to push that plastic into and create that product that we want and a mold is kind of a big upfront cost or um, you know, effort. So a lot of people don't commit to that immediately. Um, so sometimes we prototype, um, and that's even cardboard, you know, cardboard modeling as well, um, just to get a better idea of what product you want to make. Great. Okay. Right. Our timer has gone, so our plastic should be ready. Um, <laughs> we're just uh, putting the camera in the person's position. <laughs> All right, so, um, so our molds are normally kind of these mesh things. So we've put a clear top on this one. And so you might be able to see there's kind of spaces. I'm going to make some small carabiners. And so we put the clear top on so you can see 
see the plastic going in. So this is at the bottom of that hot pipe. So essentially we've got a molten plastic, which is looking nice and gooey. I'm just gonna take that first little bit away. That's usually a little bit colder. And then I'm going to clamp our mold against the nozzle. And then hopefully you'll be able to see green plastic going around. So hopefully you can see this green, green open stars. Right, and then I can undo this. So the product, you know, a lot of people are amazed how quickly we can take the items out. Um, and that's basically because you're, you know, we're heating the plastic. Um, in this case, we're heating it at about 170 degrees. Um, some plastic we melt at over 200 degrees. Um, and you know you bring it into a mold which is maybe 10 degrees so it cools very quickly um, and solidifies okay, let's push these out So, so they're made with their, this kind of gate piece sticking out, and that means we can use the plasticity of the plastic to kind of push it back in, and then it springs back by itself. So again, another kind of interesting property of plastic is that it has that kind of plasticity and that flexibility. And that is, is simply the process. So there are other things that we looked at. A different mold, for example. So this is the plant pot mold, where we create little plant pots. So this one again is made out of white and green bottle tops. So this is your, your semi-skimmed pot coming over with your milk bottle tops. Um, and so yeah, we can make you know lots of different products depending on what mold we have. And that is the basic process. So that happens, I say, on on a bigger scale. So there are injection molding machines which are much bigger than ours, creating hundreds of products um, a day. Our process is obviously very manual and a bit slower, but again, we're creating very different products to what these kind of large industries are creating. So hopefully you saw that was interesting. Um, that is, uh, yeah, quite simply how plastic recycled. Um, and the unique thing here is that we can do it all under one roof. We take the plastic, we process it, we sort it, we shred it, um, and then melt it and reform it. So we know uh, what plastic comes in, what plastic goes out. That's why I thought the question earlier was interesting asking um, if it was about tracing how it all goes um, rather than kind of a trace of a different material. Because uh, what we're trying to do is uh, trace exactly from what waste comes in, or waste, um, to the final product out. So uh, as a, someone who might buy one of our plant pots, they might be able to scan a QR code or look on our website um, and put in like a serial number and it would tell them you know, oh, your plant pot has been made with, um, you know, 40 grams of white bottle tops from local collections in Lancaster and 40 grams of green bottle tops in local collections in Lancaster. But you might go onto one of our cones um, that we've made and it says, you know, you're made from 20% DVD cases, 30% yarn cones and 50% bottle tops. So that way, um, an individual buying product can see exactly what them what material has gone into that product but also for those who are uh, kind of recycling their plastic with us they have that transparency of what they've done with their you know the material that they would throw in the bin otherwise um, and so they kind of have a an ownership of plastic and they can say 
to someone like the Environment Agency that audits people. Uh, we have recycled hydraulic plastic. They have recycled 100 kilos of our waste into you know, 500 plant pots, 200 cones, and 50 soap dishes, for example. So we're really excited, again, with this kind of small scale idea that we can spend effort tracing material. Okay, so uh, the last little bit I want to talk about um, oh, that was slide, is um, I talked a bit about trying to keep material cycling around. So I want to talk a bit about the circular economy. And before that, we're going to talk about kind of a bit more of what we live in now, which is the linear economy. So this idea is that we we mine things or we gather materials generally kind of out of the ground, out of the earth. Um, so in this case, you know, we might dig uh, deep in the crust for oil. We make plastic products for that. So we make manufactured products and then those products are used and we dispose of them. And so that might be um, in the bin, which end up going into landfill um, or they might go into an energy from waste facility or an incinerator where they burn it and you get some energy back. Um, and then of course, if these uh, kind of processes are mismanaged um, and not managed well, we're starting to see things end up in the ocean um, and we're starting to see all of the effects that having on wildlife um, and whatnot. And equally, you know, putting it into landfill, you know, we're just burying a problem and it's still there. Um, you know, things like plastic last for a very long time. So it's still gonna be there for a very long time. So that's kind of a lot, and there's a huge design flaw where, you know, if we look at, I've got that image above the oil of like a sandwich packet, that packet has been made, um, you know, with a life of about a few days, because you put, you know, a manufacturer is gonna put their sandwich in it. You might buy that um, from the shop. Once you've eaten that sandwich, you're probably gonna put that in the bin because you don't need it anymore. It's kind of useless to you. Um, that's all it was designed for. Um, so we need to get away from this idea of designing things to be used for a very short amount of time, particularly if it's using material such as plastic that lasts for a very long time. I mean, just think about how we can reuse those things. Uh, so we've already had the example with Jan and her, you know, she had her clear tub that she said, you know, has mushrooms in it and she's using it to store other things. Um, so I do the same. I've had mushroom tubs that I store my felt tips in. Um, here we use them to store some of the products in because um, we can organize organize it all a little bit easier. So transitioning more to kind of a circular economy, the idea is that we should never really get to that landfill or incineration area. We should never be throwing something away. We should be keep kind of cycling it around the world. Um, so we could still start from mining material out of the ground. Um, although might, we might look at kind of recycling material, what we have already and reduce that um, and stop digging out oil. Um, we make our products and then we keep using those products. And if we can't use them for their original purpose, we might use them for a different purpose. So for example, we've got like a black um, crate. So we could keep that crate, we might've been having uh, food transported on it. And you could keep using that crate to transport food on, or maybe you use it to transport something else on. Maybe that crate breaks. Um, to which some people might think, well, it's broken, it's useless, I have to throw it in the bin, um, which is also kind of one of the problems in our world where plastic has become so cheap that we think, well, it's sometimes easier to, you know, throw that one away and then buy a new one. But instead of doing that, we can look at fixing it. So something that we fix at, at Relic, we've had people come with kayaks. So if you think of plastic boats um, that come in, that you might be going down a river and they hit a rock um, and that rock um, breaks the surface, we can repair that. So like metal, you get welding, you can do the same with plastic where you melt it um, and reform it and fix it. So it might be that, or you know, it might be fixing it another way. Um, and then even if you can't fix it, maybe we can shred it like we do here and turn it into something new. And that new product we keep trying to use as much long as we can for its original purpose. Um, and you know, maybe if it breaks beyond repair, or it needs a new purpose, then again, that is still a material that we can reuse. Um, so I've got this example where, you know, we might turn bottle tops into a comb and then, you know, maybe that comb just goes back in shreds and it can become a new comb, or maybe it becomes, um, 
something like a sheet and we can use that for something else. So the idea is that we keep things away from being disposed of. You know, I've said the words thrown away, um, but there is kind of no away. There are still, they still end up on a, um, and they still end up being a problem. And to kind of make this maybe somewhat a bit simpler, there's something called the waste hierarchy, where at the top, we've got what we should focus on the most, and like the most important is reducing at the bottom um, what we want the least amount of, and um, kind of like the least important, which is disposing. So like that idea of landfill. And so, you know, if we can reduce the amount of stuff we use um, in the first place, so if you think if we if we reduce the amount of plastic we use in the first place, we won't have as much of a problem as we do with plastic now. There won't be as much spilling into the ocean. There won't be as much to bury in landfill. Um, there won't be as much to recycle. If we are making products from these materials, can we reuse them? So like that idea of the crate, can we keep using that material as a crate? Um, if it breaks, we can repair it um, or we can fix it. Uh, or maybe we can, you know, slightly change its purpose with a different functionality. And then we can think about recycling. So, um, you know, we are here at Relic, we're fourth on the list um, of kind of importance, um, which we, we recognize, you know, we don't want to be recycling loads of material. Um, we do it kind of, it's, it's engaging. And like we said, we, we can show people all the process here, uh, but really, and we, we do repair things and we try and reuse things. And this is why we do a lot of, our workshops where we talk about the more important things of reducing and reusing. Um, but we find kind of the recycling process is really interesting and it, it gets people's attention. And then we can start talking about the bigger picture um, and why we can't recycle our way out of the problem. And then yeah, on the last list, there's recover, uh, which is kind of recovering energy from it. So I talked about if we burn the material, we might get energy back and so we, can, we might um, if we burn it, we get heat. So like if we burn coal or gas, we get heat and that can drive a turbine and that creates electricity, um, which is good. We get some energy back from it, um, but it doesn't promote these ideas of keeping materials surfing around. Like we want to focus that on that last. And then worst case, things like landfill, well, we're burying it in the ground um, and not solving anything really. Um, so yeah, so that sums up what I want to talk to you. So we've talked about uh, a bit about what we do. So precious plastic, um, it's kind of a global community of small scale recyclers, each doing little different bits and pieces. Uh, plastic, you know, there are lots of different types. It's very complicated for uh, the system and as individuals to know what plastic is what, how to dispose of it properly, um, which is one of the big problems we have. Uh, we're showing you how we recycle plastic. So we kind of make it smaller, shred it down, we melt it, we reform it. Uh, and then finally, you know, why it's important that we need to kind of be reducing, reusing where we can. Um, and hand in hand with that, thinking about the product design of things that they're made to last a long time and kept being used. So if we've got a bit of time, then I can answer any more questions. Um, and if you have questions, pop them in the chat. And again, Jan, if you could post those. Yep, I will do that. Um, I was really interested in what you said about there's no throw away. There is no away, um, which I think is a really, a really important message. The other thing I wanted to, to ask you about was um, you talk about recycling. Um, but there is another re in a waste hierarchy It's about repurposing. So to what extent would you say that what you do is recycling or repurposing? Um, well, I think I'd still say we're recycling. So I think the difference is about the kind of energy you put in. So if you think what you've seen today, you've seen us put kind of electricity into a motor that drives those blades um, and shreds material. And we're using electricity to heat plastic up uh, to melt it. Um, and if we're thinking about you know consumption generally, so we, we talked a lot about materials and products on Earth, but if you think about electricity and electricity generation, that might be using materials or, or you know we have to get electricity from somewhere. It comes from kind of energy. Um, so I'd say that's where recycling comes in, is if you're putting a lot more energy into something, you might be recycling it. Whereas repurposing, um, 
I mean, I guess loosely, again, like, you know, that mushroom tub was destined to be used for mushrooms to go to a supermarket for someone to pick them up, eat the mm. mushrooms, and then throw that tub, um, you know, hopefully into a recycling bin. But you're now using it for pens. So you've kind of repurposed it or whatever you're using it for. But I use, you know, I've reused them for, for pens, for example. So I'd say that's a bit more of a repurpose or, you know, I kind of mentioned like if we repair something, you might repair it in such a way it, it might not be used as, um, orig its original purpose, um, but you could use it for a new purpose. Okay. So that's where I think the, the difference lies. Yeah, yeah. Because I've seen different definitions of, of repurposing, um, sometimes, and differentiating between the two, where recycling is you're turning something back into the same thing, whereas repurposing is more what you're doing about taking something and turning it into something else. So. So yeah, great. Thank you for the answer. That was fantastic. Um, there's nothing else in the chat. There's no other questions in there. So I just wanted to finish up by saying a, a big thank you to that. I've, I've wanted to see your operation for some time and it's just been really insightful to see um, the processes in practice. So thank you very much for the session today, Martin. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. All right, pleasure, no, brilliant. All right, I'll see you soon. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.